Shabbat Shalom and Moadim Simcha. The story is told of a married couple who celebrated their 40th wedding anniversary by throwing a big party. During the banquet, celebrating their 40 years together, Chaim's friends requested that Chaim offer a brief account of the benefits of a marriage of such long duration. Tell us, Chaim, just what is it you've learned from all these wonderful years with your wife? Chaim thinks for a second and then he responds, well, I've learned that marriage is the best teacher of all. It teaches you loyalty, patience, humility, self-restraint, forgiveness, and a great many other qualities you wouldn't have needed if you'd stayed single. <laughs> While one might joke about the challenges of marriage, the truth is that marriage can really be a profound blessing when both parties to the marriage are committed to these same qualities of loyalty, patience, humility, self-restraint, and forgiveness. These qualities are necessary, however, not only for marriage, but also for whenever we are in relationship with another human being. Parents and children, siblings, co-workers, friends, all rely on these characteristics to keep their relationships healthy. As you well know, our society is in the midst of a breakdown in relationships. From politicians, to entertainers, to our neighbors, to our family. People who struggle to express the qualities of patience, humility, self-restraint, and perhaps most of all, forgiveness, surround us at every turn. It is then with that in mind that we turn to the final days of the season of repentance. On Monday morning, Hoshana Rabbah, We'll beat branches of the willow and pray that just as the leaves fall from the branch, so too will the last of our sins fall away from God's attention. Then on Tuesday with Shemini Atzeret, we'll pray that God will forgive our trespasses and that God will reward us with proper rains during the winter months in Israel so that we might receive ample food come springtime. And of course, we'll celebrate the end of our season of repentance with Simchat Torah, the festival of our true joy, as we conclude reading the Torah and begin yet again. Yet there is one aspect of this holiday season, one aspect of this holiday season that is often overlooked, a central uh, element to these high holidays, including Sukkot, that we often forget. Just as we hope that God forgives us for our misdeeds, and just as we hope our friends and our family, and especially our spouses, forgive us for our mistakes, we are commanded to forgive others. If we want to receive forgiveness and be sealed in the book of life, then we too must forgive. So it is that we mark this day of Shabbat Cholam Sukkot. In our Torah reading just a couple minutes ago, we left the cycle of weekly readings in order to turn back to the book of Exodus. As you recall, God gifted to Moses and to our ancestors the Ten Commandments. Coming down from Mount Sinai, however, God and Moses witnessed the people worshiping the golden calf. God is ready to annihilate the entire people until Moses pleads for God's forgiveness and God ultimately relents. As a sign of God's compassion, God invites Moses back up the mountain where God allows Moses to catch a glimpse of God's presence. Moses carves another set of tablets, and then Moses celebrates God's kindness by proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, Adonai, Adonai, El Rachum V'chanun, a God of compassion and grace, slow to anger, abounding in kindness and faithfulness, extending kindness to the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. Moses received the second set of tablets on the tenth day of Tishrei, on Yom Kippur the day of forgiveness. Forgiveness, however, is not just for God to offer to us. We are obligated, required, commanded by Jewish law to forgive as well. I have the great honor of sitting with families in their most joyful of times and in their most difficult of times. A trend that I'm seeing far too often is families in which one member no longer speaks to another. A parent who will not talk to an adult child, a child who won't talk to his parent, siblings who cannot sit in a room together. Joyful times are less joyful 
because of these conflicts. The sad times are sadder because of these conflicts. Part of this reason is our own stubbornness to admit when we've done wrong. Part of the reason too though, for the breakdown in the family structure is our own stubbornness to offer forgiveness. In these cases, it's clear to me that withholding forgiveness harms both the perpetrator and the victim. Certainly when one asks sincere forgiveness of us, we're obligated to forgive. Jewish law considers anyone who withholds forgiveness to be cruel. But should we forgive someone who has wronged us if the offender has not requested forgiveness? The great legal codifier Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon Maimonides Rambam teaches that it's the victim's obligation. It's the victim's obligation to inform the offender of his mistake. The wrong party should ask of the perpetrator, Lama sidili kach v'chach? Why did you do this to me? Why did you sin against me on this matter? In this way, the victim ensures that the person who wronged him knows about the offense and that the perpetrator thereby receives an opportunity to request forgiveness. Indeed, often we feel wronged, but the person who harmed us has no idea that they've done something wrong. The Talmud tells the story of Rabbi Zerah. We read, when Rabbi Zerah had a complaint against a person who insulted him, Rabbi Zerah would pace back and forth and present himself so that the offender would come and appease him. Indeed, the Torah tells us that we're forbidden from hating another person in our hearts and we're forbidden from bearing a grudge. If someone wronged us, then even as the victim, we must inform the person of their offense against us, give them the opportunity to apologize, and then offer the forgiveness requested. Additionally, an ancient teaching suggests that holding on to anger is like grasping a red hot coal in our hands in anticipation of throwing it at the one who wronged us. While we seek recompense, the coal is burning our hand. Very little is gained by holding on to anger and resentment. In fact, practicing forgiveness can actually lower blood pressure and improve the body's immunity response. We are healthier when we forgive. There are, of course, exceptions to our obligation to offer forgiveness. In our own modern times, we might suggest that physical or emotional abuse are such exceptions. It is, I think, an interesting discussion to have. In my learning, however, Jewish law offers only two conditions in which the victim need not forgive the perpetrator. The first is in cases of slander. Our rabbis explain that the actions of a slanderer are irreversible and that the repercussions are felt not just by the victim, but also by his kids, his family, generations yet to come. The second instance, according to Jewish law, in which the victim need not forgive is when the perpetrator will actually benefit from the victim's withholding of forgiveness. Perhaps the Talmud suggests withholding forgiveness will light a fire in the perpetrator for him to perform greater acts of kindness and righteousness. In that case, because the perpetrator benefits from the lack of forgiveness offered to him, the aggrieved might be permitted to withhold forgiveness. There is no discussion to my knowledge, however, that allows the victims of abuse to avoid confronting his or her abuser. There is no permission to my knowledge that a victim of abuse may withhold forgiveness from the attacker. Perhaps this is a hole in traditional Jewish law that needs fulfilling. Perhaps it isn't though. And Judaism requires that we work through difficult relationships in order to achieve justice and to gain healing. Recently, I came across a Facebook post shared widely that really bothered me. It reads, you're allowed to walk away from people who constantly hurt you. You're allowed to walk away from people who've abused you. You're allowed to walk away from people who don't love you. You're allowed to create boundaries. You're allowed to choose your breaking point. Then the message concludes, stop encouraging people to deal with toxi toxicity and drama. Stop encouraging people to deal with toxicity and drama. I think that I disagree. Certainly it's true that one should never tolerate another person hurting them, abusing them, or acting cruelly toward them. Certainly one should create healthy boundaries. At the same time though, 
I wonder whether, whether this sort of 21st century language releases the aggrieved from doing the hard work of offering forgiveness, an act that truly grants health and peace to both the wronged and the perpetrator. If we keep walking away from toxicity and drama, I fear that we will never heal, that those who commit cruelty will never stop, and that our society will thus continue to be full of toxicity and drama. This Shabbat I ask of you, in what situations do you think victims are obligated to forgive? And in what situations are victims not obligated to forgive? When do you think those who are wrong should walk away from challenging situations? And when should the wrong stay put and respond to the perpetrator to seek recompense and to receive an apology? The Mishnah teaches, for sins against God, the day of atonement atones. But for sins of one person against another, the day of atonement does not atone until one person asks forgiveness from the other. With the last days of the season of forgiveness upon us, let us remember that it takes a degree of humility and faith to ask God for forgiveness, yet we're obligated to do so. Let us remember that it takes wisdom and courage to ask forgiveness from another person and that we are obligated to do so. Let us remember too, that it takes strength, real strength, to offer forgiveness to another, and that, in most circumstances, we are obligated to do this as well. On this Shabbat Cholam Sukkot, may God forgive us for our misdeeds. On this Shabbat, may our friends and our family, and especially our spouses, forgive us for our mistakes, and especially our bad jokes. And now, with the Book of Life nearly closed, May we choose to forgive others as well. Adonai Ozi Amoyitain, Adonai Barecha the Movashalom. May God grant us strength, may God grant us peace, and let us say together, Amen. Shabbat Shalom and Moadim Lasimcha.